Aloha Kako and welcome to the show Policy for the People. I'm your host, Minara Mordecai. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Dean Neubauer, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the University of Hawaii at Mauna Loa. Aloha Dean, welcome to the show and thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to talk about international education and its impact on Hawaii. Welcome. Thank you, Minara. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for asking me. Um, I want to begin by looking at the national landscape of international education. Um, you've been working in the field of international education for a number of years. Um, do you find that it's changed much in the U.S. over the last five years? If so, what forces have contributed to the changing landscape? Well, uh, that's a three-part question disguised mm -hmm. as, uh, as one, actually, because um, there were a, a couple of things that I would call major structural variables that were in play uh, prior to COVID. And with the arrival of COVID, uh, you suddenly get uh, something that's uh, radically different across the globe. So those three structural factors, uh, the other two uh, that we saw playing out were on the one hand, the, um, the emergence of international education as uh, an increased global currency. Uh, it always had uh, significant currency, but uh, it had continued to grow over the last uh, decade or so particularly uh, with the enormous influx of Chinese students outside of China, but also students from other parts of Asia, and then African students into China. Uh, so if you look at those numbers, they kind of go up like this on, on, uh, on, both, uh, on both sides of things. And uh, that's a, a complicated story that we'll bypass here, but simply to say that it represented uh, the, the, the dual face of higher education um, period. And that is on the one hand, uh, it is an enormous boon to the receiving country. So that if you go back into national data uh, and look at the amount of uh, financial input to American higher education over the last 10, 12 uh, years uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, it is a steeply rising curve. So what's the, uh, what's the other side of that? And the other side of that is dependence. And so uh, increasingly one can uh, make the argument and many have, uh, Simon Martinson uh, perhaps most famously about the, um, the possible downsides of becoming um, financially dependent on, on uh, international education. And so just prior to the pandemic, the, uh, the United States was uh, having uh, well over uh, a million uh, students. And that was uh, despite the fact that our previous president, when he came into office, uh, sent out a set of signals that um, reduced, if not cut off, uh, uh, higher education endeavors in the United States from uh, from Muslim countries. So the the uh, the collection of that observation is that uh, prior to uh, the pandemic, uh, one could go throughout uh, higher education country after country and look at the dependence. Uh, the United States was outdone actually by Australia. Uh, by explicit policy, the Australian national government mandated that its national universities produce 25% of their budgets with the income from international mm -hmm. students, um, which they did. And uh, so in, in many respects, Australia had the largest um, uh, dependency uh, on, on uh, international education. Uh, and then when the pandemic uh, arrived, it uh, uh, hit them even worse than, than it did in the United States. But what it did to the United States was to um, uh, just cut a hole 
in the budgets of uh, significant numbers of universities. And then to make just one more point, six months into the pandemic, it becomes apparent that as many as 600 higher education institutions in the United States will not see the other side of the pandemic for reasons of um, financial uh, exigency. That's interesting. You mentioned um, briefly that the previous president had instituted during his administration some of the policies that stifled um, in, in international education, specifically in coming of international students to the U.S. Can you say a little more about what specifically were those policies and how did they work in the university? Well, with, you might recall within um, months of his taking office, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, through executive order, um, bans the migration into the United States of people from six Muslim countries. And uh, there is then uh, a pushback on that by, uh, by a variety of, of sectors uh, and throughout higher education. But it becomes part of what is then uh, the, uh, the play of forces throughout the Trump administration, where on the one hand, you have a set of policies that have been inherited from past practices and specifically from the previous administration. Then there is uh, coming from the president, uh, from the executive office, sets of announcements which impact those policies. And then they are followed by the differential behavior of those who are in those agencies who say, in effect, we don't want those policies. The president has no right to do that, et cetera, et cetera. The New York Times on the past Sunday uh, has a long article um, in the opinion section on exactly this dynamic playing out within the Census Bureau uh, and, <clears throat> and Trump's determination uh, not to count uh, people uh, to, to make not too much out of that, who are unlikely to vote for him, uh, but who also tend to be uh, 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 overwhelmingly uh, Latino. Uh, and then people in the Census Bureau who simply got their back up and said, you know, we're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. And so that's a dynamic that was playing out within higher education as well. On the one hand, Trump was uh, seeking to, uh, to create uh, a policy through these uh, actions. And then there was significant pushback through the Congress, et cetera, et cetera. But it uh, roiled uh, higher education, if you will, and uh, led to uh, four years of uh, various kinds of uh, diminutives in which uh, universities tried to figure out uh, what they could do in terms of their engagements in international education and which of those things might bump into uh, difficulty with, uh, with federal authorities and indeed, indeed with the courts. So since Trump had um, lost the election, the new president has come in, have you seen a shift in some of these policies? So on the one hand, we have perhaps a change in the formal policies. On the other hand, do you feel like the perception that the United States is not a welcome place for international students, is that still there? So what is your opinion about the perception and the shift in policy? Complicated question, Manar, because of COVID, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, if, if one didn't have COVID, one would have a way of looking straight at that question and saying, uh, yes, this was happening and then it was interrupted by Trump and now we're going back to X. But the fact is what we're going back to uh, in most instances has no relationship to what was there formerly. And so um, throughout international higher education and particularly what we're looking at here in the United States is relationship of, of American institutions 
to international students, uh, so much of that has become uh, non-in-person. And by being non-in-person, it avoids the literal phenomena of taking a body through customs, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but but raises all kinds of other other questions, as as you well know. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So we actually don't know what that landscape is going to look like until after COVID. And then um, the other part is finance, finances, right? Well, I would say in addition, yes, I, I'll get to finance in a, in a minute, mm -hmm. but I would say on the other side of that <clears throat> in the earlier question, that you raised is, you know, what what was going on in higher education uh, structurally, and um, since uh, uh, 2016, we've become accustomed to talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which Im embodies uh, the extent to which uh, artificial intelligence is being used uh, in a whole variety of ways, and. What the pandemic has done is, uh, is to put um, energy into that phenomena that was just um, unfathomable uh, prior to the pandemic. And so what we have seen uh, now in an effort to hold on to some sense of normality, and what I mean by that is, uh, here you are, um, a department at X university, it could be the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and you've got a Y number of students and um, uh, they suddenly uh, were out of the country and now can't get back in the country, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this um, uh, relationship with them through um, uh, the dynamics of artificial intelligence and then uh, because that's the situation all over the world, you have once again this kind of flamethrower uh, on 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 the base of uh, of these AI uh, innovations, and the question becomes, what indeed will uh, any of in place education be uh, after the pandemic, given the fact that. Um, so much reliance has been done. And just to mention one thing there, which uh, is certainly true of the University of Hawaii, but I've been around enough to know uh, that it, uh, it's common uh, throughout. <clears throat> and that was uh, forcing the faculty in a very, very short time frame to become um, at, at least marginally uh, efficient and sufficient in distance education to replace in-person uh, education. And now if you look at the literature, the literature is just uh, chock full of, um, of studies about uh, what succeeds and what doesn't succeed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we're in a different era. Uh, and that era uh, is so defined by COVID that it tends to uh, cover over the uh, AI portion. But just before I leave that, prior to the pandemic, we had um, a meeting of uh, some colleagues uh, from the University of Hawaii and the East-West Center and, and a network that uh, we have in Asia on the impact of artificial intelligence on higher education and, uh, and then the impact of artificial intelligence in, in nations. And it was widely accepted in Japan, for example, that perhaps as many as 40% of jobs that were currently existing would disappear over the next decade to be replaced by uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and so that, you know, it's, to me, I, I, I don't even know where to begin to think uh, about a society uh, in which 40% uh, percent of the jobs uh, go away as a result of uh, artificial intelligence. But it, um, it is a dynamic which is running under COVID and, uh, uh, and, and, and coincident with it and which COVID has brought to the fore as uh, the only viable solution to keeping uh, higher education in any form that we know it uh, in place. And, um, and it, it, 
it, it will continue. Just one last thought about that, if you will. Uh, last week, Dan Brown, an epidemiologist from the University of Hawaii, produced locally an hour-long uh, review uh, of COVID-19 uh, uh, throughout the world and with particular emphasis on Hawaii. And it's Dan's belief, as it is for a number of epidemiologists, um, that COVID uh, may not disappear until 2024. Mm. Uh, so it's not like, you know, what are we going to do next week? So here I'm sitting in Hawaii while you are away watching uh, the University of Hawaii uh, get prepared to open next week. And I was just on the Manoa campus uh, this morning. And um, um, at, at some level, nobody knows. Uh, they'll try it this way. They've been extraordinarily thoughtful in how to do it, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's in-person education uh, mm -hmm. because that's the bread and butter of higher education throughout the world is in-person education. But, uh, unfortunately, international students are still, still struggling getting into the country because of various travel restrictions. Is that totally. correct? Totally. Yeah. So there is an added layer of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, on, on, on the positive side of that, uh, it's extraordinary in, in our university. And then it, as one goes to the literature, uh, you can see uh, what's happening in other universities. Uh, the immense creativity that mm -hmm. has gone into uh, distance education since it moved from being really, mm -hmm. to be frank, marginal to in-person education, um, to the main dish, uh, because let's face it, these are powerful institutions. And once they uh, put their collective mind to something, uh, you get a lot of change. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned that universities are definitely getting financial gain from having international students. Um, but there are other uh, benefits to having international collaborations and international uh, presence of international students on campus, specifically visiting scholars and graduate students. Um, what are some of the key studies and research areas that are currently benefiting from international university collaborations? And specifically, if you know of any in Hawaii. Yeah, there, um, there, there are three um, kind of answers uh, mm -hmm. to that, if you will. One is um, what is what I would call uh, the sociology of, uh, of in-person education uh, in a university anywhere. Uh, and that's who, who, who learns what from whom. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it, it extraordinarily well um, reflected in the research that the single most benefit of person-to-person -person education is not what you learn in the classroom, it's what you learn uh, by being in the environment of, of higher education. And so um, that's what uh, is, is being at stake here. And what is happening is the emergence, uh, and I don't think we've seen enough of it yet, at, at least I haven't, uh, mm -hmm. but I think we will in the next couple of years, in what I would call the informal uh, electronic sociology of uh, higher education. Um, it's how students and faculty come to know each other and engage each other uh, outside the person to person uh, classroom. The second, a large component of that is um, opening up the door to what has been, um, I won't say a separation, but, but, well, in many ways, it's been a separation between the research component of higher education institutions and, um, and the teaching and, and socialization uh, components. And that's always been complicated. And, and those of us who've been in the business have simplified it simply by uh, trying to have a way to talk about it that's sensible. But um, it is uh, a, a well-known thing uh, in higher education, and you know it yourself, uh, that as you go through that process, you learn 
uh, as an individual as much from the socialization that you have with your uh, peers uh, as you do from anything that you uh, might gain from the faculty, despite how brilliant uh, they might be. Uh, and so um, what we're having here in, in, in the AI uh, once again, to repeat myself, is um, is an emergent structure, mm -hmm. and that emergent structure is uh, is is progressing rapidly, and the research is uh, beginning to uh, to pop out. Um, and the next year, I would um, venture to say, um, you know, twenty thirty percent of the articles in the higher education policy journals will be about that phenomenon. Um, because it affects another part of higher education that we rarely talk about, and that is how you administer that structure. Mm -hmm. uh, because in fact, what people have at the administrative level have had to do over the last uh, 18 months is how to run, learn how to run institutions in ways that they were almost entirely unprepared to do. And, um, and those who do it successfully uh, are going to end up with, uh, you know, less red on, on, uh, on the balance sheet, uh, as opposed to those who don't. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you've worked with a number of international students um, who came to the University of Hawaii and then decided to remain in Hawaii and contribute to that um, either by being a researcher or getting jobs. So there is a distinct benefit to the economy that we're seeing from international students and international education. Extraordinary. And, and, yeah. and in Hawaii, just to take a, a local uh, incident, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that Hawaii has suffered from for the last uh, three decades has been the distribution of physicians throughout the mm -hmm. island. And um, Honolulu and Oahu tend to be, because uh, that's where the big hospitals are, uh, tend to be doctor magnets. And by the time you get to the big island in Kauai, uh, much less so. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just listening to um, uh, 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 Mr. Green, who is the Dr. Green, who's the Lieutenant Governor of Hawaii, mm -hmm. talk about how uh, the pandemic is helping to, um, along with those who have come to Hawaii from outside, migrating both from the mainland and, and from outside the U.S., uh, to situate themselves in, um, in rural Hawaii. And that's a phenomenon that uh, my looking at the research says is very prevalent uh, in the rest of the United States. So where do most of the graduate students in the United States come from? Uh, mm -hmm. And the answer is China and India. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they do? Uh, well, uh, we, you know, take, taking some liberties uh, here with, with the actual science, uh, significantly uh, Chinese students are, are much more likely to end up in uh, the hard sciences and engineering. Um, and Indian students, despite the fact that they have a significant pre uh, presence mm -hmm. in engineering, uh, are much more likely to end up uh, in medicine. So one of the things that you see in the United States today is we go around you know, taking COVID shots from this administrator and that administrator throughout the United States is that uh, to my eye, 50 to 60% of them uh, are, are, are South Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the, the question is, uh, is how will the pandemic affect higher education recruitment, part A? Part B is to the extent that it's not pers person to person, to what extent will that affect the migration of these extraordinarily talented people into uh, the workforce, and uh, and and that's a complicated question. Mm, yeah, and uh, what I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a definite benefit to having international education channels open, tempered so that there isn't an over dependence on it, but um, we can measure benefits specifically to our state, to Hawaii, by 
the number of um, graduates that contribute to the economy, the number of tuition, the amount of tuition dollars that is contributed to the university. So we're seeing um, some of these concrete benefits. Um, the international education is in this flux where it's affected by COVID, it's affected by, by um, previous administration policies. And what I ask of all my guests as an expert, if you were given a seat at the decision makers table at the state level, what policies would you put into place today for both short-term and long-term impact on international education that can benefit the state going forward? That's a great question. And I would ask those sitting at the table with mm -hmm. me, <clears throat> are we confident that the pathways that we are seeking to open to innovation at all levels in, in all fields are there, or what has historically been the case in uh, not only in Hawaii, but other places as well, in the name of having an open door, do we partially um, have it closed? for some of those who may not look exactly like the ones that we want to come through the door. And, and I think that's a, 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 a critical issue. I think that, um, and that takes us to a whole nother subject that we managed to avoid throughout most of this um, a conversation, which is uh, the research and nationalism that has been the result of uh, the previous administration and how that um, is affecting uh, politics in, uh, in, in all of the states. And uh, a whole nother subject is the extent to which state public universities are a consequence of that politics in places where uh, not only the pandemic, but the um, preferred policies of the previous administration have led to an extraordinary intensification of, uh, of, of the political structure. Mm -hmm. And that plays out in boards, uh, boards of regents, that plays out in um, uh, what happens in the legislature, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those will be the unsettling uh, issues, I think, Manara, in, uh, uh, in, in the coming three to five years. Interesting. So the policy implementation it needs to happen at several levels, beginning with state, as well as um, Board of Regents, and perhaps even at um, departmental level. Right? Yes, and, and, okay. and you know me well enough to believe that. I think that that is uh, all part of the same uh, uh, set of policy questions just mm -hmm. conducted at, at different levels. And the extent that you don't involve all of those levels radically affects uh, the relative uh, effectiveness of your ability to implement the decisions that uh, come out of that, that process. Okay. This has been a really interesting conversation. Um, as you know, you and I talk about higher education quite frequently, and I always learn a lot from you. So I'm really grateful we got a chance to talk about this important topic. Um, it is in flux, and we are waiting to see what happens. But I do believe, with experts like you, that if we are, you know, if we go forward with intentional policies and good policies, that we can see the end after 2024, maybe sooner. Thank you so much. I hope that's true. I hope that's true. Thank, thank you for asking. Thank you so much, Dean. Aloha, and Aloha. take care.